Last week, I put out a video on my second channel, Sean Chandler Plus, where I shared some of my picks for the worst casting ever, and I asked for your picks for the worst casting ever, and you shared hundreds and hundreds of bad casting choices, and I had a lot of opinions on your opinion. So today I'm gonna react to your picks for the worst casting ever. Sometimes I agree with you and sometimes I don't. Let's fight. Let them fight. Peyton Christensen as Anakin Skywalker for me. Now this is a polarizing one right here and I think one where it has like very much a generational divide where people that grew up watching Hayden as Anakin have a fondness and a love for him. And a bunch of us that saw him in the theater in 2002 for the very first time were like, yikes, this isn't working for us. Something's not quite right here. And now that he's you know come back with some of the Disney Star Wars and he's very much out on the convention circuit, there is so much love for Hayden Christensen. There are people that adore him. And there is, it does it push some of those nostalgia buttons when he, he shows up in some of these Disney Star Wars shows. But what do I think about him? I don't think it worked. Um, of course, Star Wars is special to me, and so then there is enough nostalgia that there's a fondness. Whether it's simply because he got bad direction from George Lucas or because he did a bad job himself, I don't know the exact cause of it. I don't like sand. Please stop it, stop it now, turn it off. It's coarse. Turn it off, stop it. Rough and irritating. Stop it, stop it, stop it. And it gets everywhere. Stop it! But you think like a Ewan McGregor also was getting the same not particularly helpful direction from George Lucas and no one has kind of accused him of acting poorly stunted or anything like that. Whereas with Hayden, he's talking about sand and it's weird. He, he couldn't do it. Natalie Portman seemed to avoid any sort of heavy criticisms for her performances. Hayden Christensen couldn't do it. He, he needed something better from George Lucas. He needed better, whatever it was, to be convincing in the role. So I, I'm going to agree with this one. This is a bad casting choice, and someone else probably should have gotten the role. George Clooney as Batman in Batman and Robin, though I mostly blame the script and the direction. Maybe he could turn a decent portrayal under Tim Burton. Now, of course, George Clooney's Batman is infamously bad. Seven million. Never leave the cave without him. On almost every single level, it's some of his worst acting that he's ever done. It's a terrible version of Batman, the puns, all of that stuff. But I'm actually going to agree more with the back half of what you said than the first part. The idea of a George Clooney Batman, I think absolutely could work. George Clooney in real life is basically Bruce Wayne. Can George Clooney play this like rich, sophisticated playboy? Yeah, that's called being George Clooney. So I think he very easily could look and be a convincing Bruce Wayne. And beyond that, he's done action movies. Like right before he did Batman and Robin, he did From Dusk Till Dawn, where he plays this hardened criminal written by Quentin Tarantino and directed by Robert Rodriguez so he can have that edge to him? Do I think he would be a top-tier great Batman? N probably not. I don't think he's quite that. But I think he could have been a great Bruce Wayne and a good Batman, but he happened to be in this live-action cartoon that was just a total misfire from beginning to end. I think they mostly made the movie they wanted to make, they just made a movie that none of us wanted, and George Clooney happens to be starring in the film. But it's not that George Clooney couldn't be good with the right writer and director. Totally agree with you there. The whole cast of The Last Airbender 2010. I haven't fully watched the animated show. I've only seen a little bit of it. I have seen Shyamalan's film a number of times. <laughs> it's bad. The casting is peculiar. There's a couple castings in here that I think should work. The casting's not the problem. Like, you know, Dev Patel's in there and he's been fantastic and things before this and after this and since. So I don't fully blame him. There's so much wrong here. 
but a lot of the cast here is also horribly miscast. They don't fit. They don't look right. And you're not quite sure what, why did you even, why did you cast these people? Like, I don't, what are you doing here? What, what is the thought on this? Brie Larson is Captain Marvel. Is that like a personal attack or something? Now, of course, this one would be in here. She's been the target of the internet for over five years now. And honestly, I don't know what the deal is with this one. She's an Oscar winning actress. She gets an Oscar and then they're like, hey, let's cast her as Captain Marvel. On paper, everything should work here. And then now after three different performances, it's still like, how have you not figured this out yet? In her first movie, she's so stilted and wooden and just doing what everyone tells her to do while being cocky at the same time. In Avengers Endgame, she's cocky in a way that's very off-putting in the context where she's doing it, where she's like talking down to the Avengers who we know and love more than her and who are hurting and wanting to go into action. She's talking down to them, which is just such an unlikable trait. And then in the Marvels, she's more likable. There's improvement there, but there's sequences where it's like she doesn't know how to talk to humans or relate to them in a normal fashion. So the high school girl, Miss Marvel, is like, here, let's give her a hug, teaching her how to interact with humans. I don't know if this is a writing thing, a directing thing, but at this point in time, it's three different writers, three different directors or teams of writers, teams of directors, and the one common factor in all of it is Brie Larson. And for whatever reason, Brie Larson has not been able to properly bring this character to life in a way that's not really awkward. So on paper, it should be great. In practice, it hasn't worked yet. So I don't know if I'd call it the worst ever, but it hasn't worked. Tom Holland, Uncharted, and Mark Wahlberg, solely in Uncharted. What? No! This is another one of the most common ones that was listed in the comments. Totally agree. This, this is, you are correct. Uh, when it was first announced, I hadn't played the Uncharted games. And so I was like, I don't know. I mean, if it's supposed to be kind of Indiana Jones and an adventure, Tom Holland, I think, could be really good in that. And Mark Wahlberg is kind of a mentor. That, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And in that sense, can Tom Holland be an adventurer? Yes. Can Mark Wahlberg be an adventurer? Yes. Can they fit in this genre? Yes. Do they fit as Nathan Drake and Sully? No, they do not. As soon as I played the games, I was like, oh, oh, what are you doing, Sony? And I'm pretty sure exactly what happened was this project goes back 10 years where Mark Wahlberg was supposed to play Nathan Drake and had attachments and producer roles. So he, he was like signed on. He had to be in the movie. Enough time passed before between him signing on to the movie getting made that he'd aged out of being the person that they wanted to play Nathan Drake. So they just made put him in the Sully role. And then who is the golden boy at Sony back a few years ago and still to this day? Spider-Man himself. So let's put our biggest upcoming actor as Nathan Drake so we can launch this franchise with our big exciting name, plus a second big name, Mark Wahlberg. Everything is golden. Only problem, Tom Holland is way too young to play Nathan Drake. And he, he this movie comes out literally months after he played a high schooler. And so it just doesn't work. And that's like, in the games, there's an origin story for Nathan Drake and it's not this. And so it just... It doesn't fit, and it feels like we're trying to force something. Mark Wahlberg doesn't at all give off Sully vibes. He doesn't look right. And so it's a classic example of two actors I like, I really like, that can play in this genre. These are just not the right roles. They do not fit these characters. Today's video is sponsored by BetterHelp. If you don't know my story, when I started this YouTube channel, I was unemployed and in an addiction rehab program. My previous career put a lot of stress on me. I bottled it up and then I turned to alcohol as my coping mechanism. And then my coping mechanism turned into an addiction. Therapy is a safe place to get things off your chest and go figure out how to work through whatever's weighing you down. If I'd gone to therapy sooner, I could have learned how to set boundaries and avoid so much of the stress that pushed me to alcohol. I could have learned better coping mechanisms so I wouldn't have needed alcohol. And I could have avoided so much pain for myself and for those around me. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, 
flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Get it off your chest with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Sean Chandler today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Sean Chandler. AJ Daniels, frequent commenter, says Jared Leto as the Joker and... This was absolutely one of the names, one of the castings most mentioned in the comments, most liked every time people said it. When I posted about it on Twitter, so many different memes of Jared Leto's Joker. Generally speaking, I gotta agree with you. But it's another one of those ones where, on paper, it seemed good. He had just won an Oscar when he was cast. Like, cast his, it gets his Oscar... And then he's cast as the Joker. And so it's like, oh, Oscar winner Jared Leto's going to be the Joker. This should be really interesting. I wonder what he's going to do with this. And then you just get this bizarro interpretation of the character. So I made a decision and it was wrong. It was a bad call, Ripley. It was a bad call. Bad call. Right. Where it just goes so edgelord that like damaged is tattooed on his forehead. He's got the grill. There's, it just, it doesn't work. Combine that with all of these reports of his bizarre method acting and all the weird and gross and creepy things that he did on the set. Ew. Another one also where you kind of go, so was the issue that David Ayer brought, like instructed him, coached him in the wrong direction? Uh, you know, David Ayer kind of has that, you know, rough part of L.A. vibe in him. That's an aesthetic of a bunch of his movies. And so all of a sudden you have this tattooed up uh, Joker with a grill. Like, is that some of David Ayer kind of bringing his influences and kind of his background into the Joker? And then Jared Leto just ran in the wrong direction with all of it? I don't know, but obviously it, it didn't work. Keanu Reeves as Jonathan Harker in Bram Stoker's Dracula Absolutely. This right here is baffling how this happened, how Francis Ford Coppola allowed Keanu Reeves into this movie. I don't know what happened. I've seen many strange things already. But there was a couple of these that happened in the, the mid 90s after Point Break where Keanu Reeves was really breaking out and he shows up in Bram Stoker's Dracula and Kenneth Branagh's Much Ado About Nothing. It must not be denied, but I am a plain dealing villain. If I had my mouth, I would bite. And he is so horribly miscast. Keanu Reeves is a legend in John Wick. When he does what he's great at, he's awesome. When he's in The Matrix, it's awesome. When he's in Bill and Ted, it's hilarious. Speed, classic action movie. Point Break, classic action movie. There's a lot of things that Keanu Reeves can do really well. Period piece with where he has to do an accent. Yikes. Where he is playing against Oscar caliber actors, world class thespians doing Shakespeare and classic literature. Yikes, he is so in the wrong place. This is classic, true miscasting of taking someone that's very good at one thing and putting them in a context where they are horrible and it highlights all of their weaknesses. That's what miscasting truly means in my mind. That's what this one is. Topher Grace as Eddie Brock Venom in Spider-Man 3. Totally agree, horrible miscast. I like Topher Grace. I wish Topher Grace got more roles. I find him charming. I think he's very funny. I do not think he is remotely Eddie Brock. Eddie Brock has a very distinct vibe and it is not kind of to Topher Grace quirkiness. Like Eddie Brock in the comics is into like weightlifting. Topher Grace is not that. There's inherently, like some of the charm of Topher Grace is kind of like a certain like pathetic side to him. It always kind of feels a little bit beat up, a desperation to him, a patheticness. I don't know if that's the word for it. That's the right way to capture it. That's not Eddie Brock. 
Like there's a strength to Eddie Brock that is not in Topher Grace. And that's where Topher can play great characters that are very entertaining, that can have very powerful character arcs because they he can give off that patheticness to him and then be compelling by the end. And that doesn't fit Eddie Brock. And it doesn't fit the movie, the journey that you're trying to do of this um, competing photographer trying to take Peter Parker's job. When he kind of comes off pathetic himself, it feels like two Peter Parkers, just one of them a little bit more cutthroat rather than Eddie Brock stepping in. So I, I didn't think this one worked at all. Horrible casting um, on all senses. Alan Rickman as Snape, Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man, Johnny Depp as Jack Sparrow, Brando as the Godfather, and Daniel Day-Lewis in There Will Be Blood. That's bait. Will Smith as the genie springs to mind. <laughs> oh, wow. Hard disagree. I, I, I think Will Smith's like the best thing about that movie. And the, the simple reason for me is that for the genie, you can't try and copy Robin Williams. But you want someone that can be equally improvisationally funny, high energy, charming, but in a different way. I, I think Will Smith is perfectly that. And so in my mind, like Will Smith in that movie, that's the reason that it works is that that's like an inspired choice. He's nothing at all like Robin Williams and at the same time can bring exactly what the genie role needs. So this one, I, I wish you'd made your argument so I could actually respond and maybe have a different perspective, but based just on the statement, Will Smith is the genie, totally, like totally, totally, totally disagree with you. Henry Cavill from Man of Steel. How dare you? I don't like Henry Cavill as an actor. He's just lifeless as Superman. Not a Snyder dig. I love his Batman v Superman and Zack Snyder's Justice League. Just not big a fan of Man of Steel. Woo! This one is a, not a popular opinion, and I am certainly not going to agree with you on this one. Uh, but very bold of you to share this one since a wing of the internet. Harshly, strongly will disagree with you, as will I. Um, he's a very different version of Clark Kent that is this version coming from an idea from David Goyer, Christopher Nolan, and then interpreted by Zack Snyder. And I mean, I think that there, there's this, like, I wouldn't call it lifelessness. There's a stiffness that's there because you have a person who's not them, who's trying to not be themselves. So intentionally being stiff, he's being bullied by someone that he can destroy. And so there's a stiffness there that fits the moment and the character in that moment because he's constantly holding back until the back half of the film where he finally reveals himself uh, and comes to life. So I would passionately disagree with this one. I'm a Henry Cavill fan, and I think it is a cinematic travesty that we didn't get a proper Man of Steel 2 five years ago. That's a travesty, and if they'd actually done the DCEU right, we should have gotten it like eight years ago, then Batman v Superman, then whatever. But anyway, that's a different story altogether. If you enjoyed this video, there is a companion to it over on my Patreon page. It's a membership site with a bunch of exclusive videos, multiple weekly live streams where I do Q and A's, talk about the box office. And there's a companion video to this one where I react to even more of your picks for the worst casting ever. Join for as little as $2 per month, $21 per year. And you can gain access to that video and many more. And at some of the higher tiers, you can have your name on my end card. You can do a monthly video chat with me one-on-one. -on -one, ask all the questions you want. You can learn more about that at the link down below in the description. Here's a group one. Mickey Rooney as Mr. Yonishi, Christian Bale as Moses in Exodus, John Wayne as Genghis Khan, and Fisher Stevens in Short Circuit. These ones all were literally one right after the other on Twitter, and they are all classic examples of how incredibly racist Hollywood has been all the way up until 10 years ago and still hasn't worked its way out of the system quite yet. Uh, of course, when you go back with Miss Mickey Rooney, it's so shockingly, overtly racist, but there's just a mindset that still, just 10 years ago, had Christian Bale being cast 
as Moses in Exodus um, to where, um, yeah, uh, especially when you look back at it and you go, how could anyone think these were good ideas? How could anyone do this? That's Hollywood. Stephen Amell as Casey Jones in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows. Boo! D hard disagree on this one. No, I, I, I disagree entirely. Is he good in the movie? Does it work? Does it feel like Casey Jones? No, but this is another one where it feels entirely like it's an issue of the writing and the direction. Like if you think on paper, they cast Oliver Queen as Casey Jones. And if, if anything, it almost feels too obvious that you bring in the angsty superhero from the CW to be in your Michael Bay uh, Ninja Turtles movie as Casey Jones. It almost feels too obvious. And then you watch the movie and it just feels like they, they made him like sugary sweet. Like the, his backstory's wrong. He only wears the mask in one scene in the entire movie. And he's has spent him the whole time like, aw shucks. Do not eat us. Are you kidding me? With April O'Neil, um, none of it feels right. And none of it feels like Stephen Amell's actual skill set, what he could bring to the table. So it's hard for me to think that the casting was the problem here and not everything else. Like, he, on paper, he seems like the right guy in and, and that year, at that time, but still, it doesn't work. So I, I can kind of get what you're seeing here, but this is... And Casey Jones is one that I have strong opinions about. In fact, I mean, I've got a Casey Jones mask in my office ready to go if I need to fight crime. So I care about who plays my Casey Jones and how he's characterized. And I, I can see Stephen Amell doing a good job if he was in a movie with the right script, the right director, and he wasn't. Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor. This is another one of the most shared in the comments. And as you can even see on the graphic there, this was all, uh, one of the comments on the original video that inspired this. And it got 139 likes on it before I was even trying to get people to share their picks. That's just how much people hated this casting. And the big joke when he was first announced was because this is back 2013, right after Breaking Bad ended, is that the meme was we wanted Heisenberg, Brian Cranston, not Eisenberg. And like the obvious pick, if you want this intense guy that can be also charismatic, can be play convincing as a smart person, also be conniving, um, Brian Cranston coming off Breaking Bad. Everyone has that in their mind, and then they go with Jesse Eisenberg who had recently played Zuckerberg in The Social Network. And then the characterization, the version in the movie was Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> except weirder and quirkier. And he's like feeding people Jolly Ranchers awkwardly and he, he doing stuff like that as Lex Luthor, which is <laughs> what, what no one wants from a Lex Luthor. There's no one that's like, you know what I've been waiting for in Lex Luthor? is him for to be quirky and nerdy. Like, that's just not, like, the, what anyone hoped for. Wow. That was weird. So, this one has been rejected since before the movie came out. Uh, like, like some of the other ones, it's tough to, like... I, I think just entirely... They wanted to go for this different version where we're gonna do a very 21st century, what would a Lex Luthor be like now? And so they went, who are those types of characters in modern society? They are these tech billionaires that started software companies. So Mark Zuckerberg would be the model. And they recontextualized Lex Luthor so much that we all rejected it because it stopped being the Lex Luthor that that feels true to the comics. That's interesting. So this is one that I don't necessarily think that Eisenberg was entirely the problem. It's not like there was a different person that could have played this version would have been awesome. If you want to do this version, sure, he's the right person to do it because he was Mark Zuckerberg in a fantastic film. But doing Mark Zuckerberg as Lex Luthor 
is just a terrible idea. <laughs> it doesn't work. And so it was miscast because the entire casting direction was totally wrong. Remember, there's a companion video to this over on my Patreon page where I react to more of your picks for the worst casting ever. And please join me down below in the comment section. Let me know your thoughts on the worst casting ever. Where am I wrong? Where am I right? And who do you think is the worst? Thank you so much for watching. Keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.